Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm your host for today on the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. Today's episode is a follow-up to a recent um, episode we did, that myself and Debbie did, episode 194, which was titled, Improve Livability, What Does the Future Hold? And I guess I just wanted to publish this episode just by myself. The year is over, I guess. Everyone's gone on holidays. And um, just talk, elaborate more on some of the things we, t- we spoke about on the episode 194. We did have a, um, a follow-up email or message from Mr. Bruce Bromley from SDA Consulting Group, one of our, our friends in the SDA world. And he, um, he made a comment, and I, I just wanted to read out and clarify because I'm sure there will be other people in the same boat who are asking the same questions to what, I, what we spoke about in the episode 194. But uh, let me just go back a little bit about what we covered in episode 194. So in that episode, we talked about what's going to happen to IL long-term, short-term, medium-term, I guess. In the short-term, we know what the status is. Uh, it's still in play. Medium-term is we should see it back into, um, uh, see it possibly okay with regards to people who are already developing and building IL. But long-term is, is the, uh, the part where we don't know. We're at the mercy of the government, the NDIA, NDIS, Minister um, Bill Shorten, in confirming what is going to happen from there. The comment that uh, Mr. Bruce Bromley, our friend, made a mention to me directly was, and I quote, I heard your discussions about the dual key robust houses. What happens when both participants choose to go into the kitchen and all hell breaks loose? Who carries the liability? And that's a very, very valid comment. I also sat down with a friend of ours, uh, our, our organisation, uh, Mr. Brad Fuller, uh, an SDA provider. He also shared that same concern. But when, I, when Debbie and myself sat down with him with the floor plan to show him the floor plan that we have seen in the past and how it can be modified to suit the requirements of a dual key, a robust house, it, it made him realise that there was a possibility of a solution here. And the solution really is a temporary solution because right now we don't know what we should be doing with regards to IEL as a category because we're waiting for the for the decision of the of the government. But um, in response to uh, Bruce's comment, and this is what I said to him in writing, I said to him, hi, Bruce, thanks for your feedback. But just to clarify if there is a misunderstanding, I've put my thoughts below in greater detail to show you where I was coming from. Obviously, you don't put two robust participants into the same dwelling that could ignite a volatile situation, as you've said it above. But remember the 80-20 rule. 80% of robust participants cannot share. This is common knowledge that we all know. We've spoken about in the past few years. And 20% is able to share. But this podcast that we, we, we published last week, episode 194, isn't about robust. It's about IL. It's an IL play. The likely outcome, if you listen to the podcast, was worst case, one robust participant in this dual key dwelling. Should IL be phased out? Remember in this last episode that Debbie and I hosted, we said, well, I said, sorry, this concept plan which we're talking about is either two ILs with two OAs or two robusts with two OAs or one robust participant with one OA or one robust participant with two OAs. And we could even also see this concept design we're talking about as a sill house as well. To create flexibility for providers, uh, SIL providers to manage their participants. So I'll continue on with what I said here with um, with Bruce. It's all about the flexibility for the for the SIL provider to manage the care, how they see fit in a safe environment. And I clearly stated this. This is about IL, this specific robust dual key I spoke of in the previous podcast. I presented this pod this one floor plan I spoke about to several other providers, SIL and SDA providers, and they all agreed with my assessment. Bruce, your comments are valid, but your words assumes 
no robust participants can share, which isn't 100% true, only 80% true. 80 20 rule. It also assumes that we are taking robust participants only. This is not the basis of a podcast episode. My podcast was simply what if IL is completely removed? As an investor, if you can't afford HPS with the class three design category plus the fire sprinklers, and you can't afford FA, and you don't want to do, we don't know if, if uh, robust is the way to go because robust houses really are one tenants, right? Then what is, it, what is the alternative if IL is a question mark? So, and I said to Bruce, please listen to it again, just to hear my words. I keep on saying it's only my opinion. Continuing on with my, um, my, message to, my, my, my message back to Bruce, I sort of did that podcast without much pre-planning. I just spoke about this idea and this concept and giving my opinion because no one else has come out to say anything for the last seven days because it's just all this confusion. My solution was to throw out in the ring an idea or a concept or plan or a solution to help investors along the way with the uncertainty because I may be wrong, sure, but it also may be right as well, okay? My design that I speak of, which is still a work in progress, is not meant to house every single robust participant in Australia. I just want to design it, modify it with um, some other providers and just get the concept going and show other OTs and also share it with your office, Bruce, SDA Consulting um, Australia or SDA Consulting Group, but also show it to other SIL providers who are actually doing this kind of care um, and want flexible design houses in the rural remote areas as well. So this is just one opinion. I'm happy to bring you on board the, the podcast show, Bruce, just to discuss in the new year. I'm interviewing lots of different people in the, um, in the SDA market to get their different perspectives. But to answer your question, what happens when all hell breaks loose? And this is my answer. I'm sure lots of providers out there are questioning this whole, well, a dual key robust, really? Will it work? What if all hell breaks loose? True. It's my answer. Two carers will be on site, one on each side of the dual key, which has that common, which also happens to have a common um, kitchen and common living area as well, uh, additional second living area, lounge. So two carers will be on site and will manage the conflict that should that happen and get to that mo- moment. The two OA carers on site at 24-7, I assume that you thought we, I was talking about one carer on site. No, there's two carers on site. There would be a minimum of two carers in the house at any one time, minimum of two, could even be three or four carers in the house at the same time with these two robust participants. You have seen this as well. Two or three carers looking after one robust participant is possible in the seal market. Besides which, personality matching process would not see two robust participants in the same house if there was going to be a volatile situation to ignite. I am sure that the SA provider would have filtered and vetted both the participants and their seal providers thoroughly beforehand. And at the, I mean, to be honest, at the moment, it's just too rare to see duplex robust houses being built across Australia. It's too costly to, to build them and it's too hard to get them approved with council. It is longer and more expensive to build robust duplexes, that's for sure. And also, if you weren't going to build a robust duplex and you're building a normal robust house, they're not financially attractive enough for investors to jump into them because you're looking at 900 grand for a three bedroom, three bathroom spec design house for robust for one tenant only. And when you're looking at 90 grand rent gross before costs, minus costs, you're looking at 7 to 8%. So 10% gross costs, 7% net costs. Sorry, not many investors are looking at this as an attractive investment option in SDA. This topic of robust, which works and doesn't work, is not the purpose of this podcast, 194. It's been covered before by yourself and myself over the many years. And I don't need to go over them again. This is about IL. But I do take on board your comments, and you are probably right. No argument there. Again, this is only my opinion on helping investors think of an alternative to just withdrawing from the market and sitting on the fence and not investing anymore, which is not what the scheme wants or you and I want. We want to see the SDA as a sector where investors can adapt to change and still contribute for the greater good of of participants. An equilibrium needs to be sorted out, and a solution needs to be executed. I put my idea out there and welcome all experts to throw their ideas and the answers into the ring to give the marketplace some IL solutions given the government's stance on IL right now for 2024. And I conclude this with by saying to Bruce, Bruce, I'm no, I'm no, no means a uh, robust expert. This is your area. I'm only learning myself as an organization here with our staff. And I certainly always value your advice and techn- technical knowledge. 
we love your work and we always promote it to everyone we can. We are all learning in this space. And, and at the moment, in the IEL confusion in December 23, I thought it would be good to open the discussion openly with our opinion or my opinion. Thank you for your feedback as I will now create a follow up podcast, which, which is what I'm doing right now. And I hope that um, we can create uh, some synergies on thoughts and solutions to alleviate some of the confusion out there. It will be good to show um, our listeners that uh, we have some dialogue between yourself and myself, and that if anyone wants to reach out to your office or my office, we can discuss it further. There is no one size fits all out there when it comes to floor plans. And Bruce came back to me today with a response. The problem we have as providers for this type of dwelling is the use of restrictive practices. You would not be able to put in one place to prevent participants from accessing kitchen area long term, etc. Robust is a challenging area. We have had many discussions with many different groups around Australia, and uh, and it's a work in progress. So you know, overall, I just want to conclude by saying we hope to engage more experts in the SDA field around Australia, OTs, architects, designers, and um, assessors. Uh, to see what their thoughts are. I mean, what is a good design that we can play with and work with at the moment, given the uncertainty of IL overall? At the moment, we are all in a holding pattern, waiting for something. I spoke to another provider who said he was doing his best to to tell the investors who are ringing him up about certain areas around Perth and Melbourne and whatnot, who are about to settle on blocks of land for IL builds. He's telling them, just cancel them, cancel the deal and walk away and reassess again in the new year. Once there's more clarity from the NIS about the IEL, maybe you should look at doing purely a HPS house or doing nothing at all. Or maybe this dual key design house. So there's no right or wrong answer at the moment. It's just what can you do to hedge your bets as an investor? If you, can't, if you can afford HPS, uh, just go, go ahead and modify the design and build it the HPS design with your builder if that is in high demand in that location you're looking at. If there are too many happening out there in the marketplace, we've got to think about um, what alternative designs or locations you, you can consider, should that be the case. But in the last six months, five months, a lot of real estate agents and marketers and spookers have been out there promoting IL as an investment package for SDA investors, saying, look at these great returns. The yield is 20%, 25% return. But the problem with those uh, transactions are they're in, and I excuse my French, they're in areas, okay? If you're building product in areas, you're going to get results. If the government is pulling IL and you haven't started the construction build yet, it's a product, let's be honest, in a area, possibly by a builder. So pull the plug and walk away, my friend. Now, if you've got balls of steel then, and you feel like you got there's massive demand and there's multiple providers saying, we want the IEL or robust, whatever it is, then sure, go for it, okay? Uh, that's your call. Um, but remember, don't always believe who you're talking to or who you're listening to. Just be wary, hedge your bets, be aware of the, um, the changes in this space and um, do your research and future-proof, okay? We don't have all the answers. We're, we're merely guessing ourselves. Everyone's guessing what the outcome's going to be, but um, all you can do is, for now, know that, IEL was still in play for the next two, three, four years. Um, if you can get your build completed soon and filled up, I'm sure it'll be fine with your IEL tenants, participants in the IEL house that you're going to own. But if you are an investor who's getting an IEL build in the same street, in the same estate, in the same suburb as so many other investors, then be very, very careful, okay? Because you're paying 100 grand more than what you should be paying for a normal house. So you're overcapitalizing is, is, the, is the word there. But listen, I do wish you all a, uh, a very happy, merry Christmas and a safe um, festivities of the break. Uh, hopefully we'll get this podcast published in the next, um, before the end of the year and uh, have a few more interviews with other contacts I've had in the SDA world to give you some thoughts as well. Having spoken to Brad last few days ago, he said to me, oh, I get so many calls ringing up, talking to me about this podcast and, they, and I sort of laughed about it because I... <laughs> I said to Brad, really? We don't get much feedback um, because he goes, oh, no, they always ring me and tell me about how awesome the podcast is. So it's great to hear that uh, our podcast, which is now coming on two years now, almost two years as of February 24, um, is having such a profound impact on the investor world 
Uh, one of our new staff, um, Larissa, she says that there's nothing out there in the marketplace to give uh, guidance or education to people in the industry or investors. So we're merely doing our best the last two years and even now, two, two shows a week, to give as much uh, feedback, exposure to other experts in the SDA world and NDIS sector as well, to you, our listeners, to understand that there's, uh, there's more happening in the background overall than just SDA when we don't know everything. We are in a very niche area ourselves as, a, in a, as SDA consultants ourselves. But together, we, we all collaborate together, work together, sharing information, sharing knowledge, and sharing our experiences as well to give guidance back to you, the investors, our listeners, to have confidence in the future of NDIS 2.0. And uh, that's all we can say. And that's us wrapping up for uh, our last podcast for the year, which will all roll out with a whole bunch of other episodes coming up in the next few weeks, which have all been pre- pre-recorded and um, for your your listening. So have a good uh, Christmas and Happy New Year, and we'll see you around in the new year when we get back in the office on January the 8th, and all the staff are rearing to go after a three-week break to help you, uh, the investors in SDA. Have a good day. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.